So I think that we are ready to start the, the event. Uh, so dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the panel discussion on global collaboration with higher education to increase financial inclusion, part of the World Business Angel Investor Week. So we are here to explore the critical role of education incubators and investments in fueling the entrepreneurial success and advancing innovation in the Adriatic region. Um, we are very honored to have esteemed hosts joining us today, each bringing unique perspectives and experience. Uh, Sandra Damian, the WBF Senator for Slovenia, Aleksandr Mastilovic, WBF Senator of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Ivan Jovetic, WBF Senator for Montenegro, and Aleksandr Celeski, WBF International pa Partner for uh, Macedonia. I will uh, invite my colleagues to introduce themselves later on. But first of all, we would like to extend the sincere gratitude to WBF, um, Angel Investment Forum, the affiliated partner of G20 Global Partnership uh, for Financial Inclusion, for organizing this event and creating a platform where key stakeholders really come together to access the power uh, of angel investment as the vital financial tool for uh, boost, boosting economies. I uh, suggest we start with the opening remarks that uh, are delivered by the chairman of WBAF, uh, Mr. Uh, Bybers Altutas. So I will use the opportunity to uh, share my screen uh, with you. Dear Presidents, dear Ministers, dear country Chairs, and dear Participants, because education and entrepreneurship education have come a long way in the past two decades. The mindset of students of entrepreneurship has changed as well and will continue to evolve. More and more business organizations are developing an entrepreneurial industry. Even conservative businesses are making it a priority to boost their entrepreneurial energies and promote a culture of creativity and innovation. Most innovative business ideas come from young people. Current and future entrepreneurs and investors need specialized knowledge and a highly complexity of skills to move innovative ideas into the market and ensure they succeed. All of this suggests that it is time for higher education institutions to take on a new role. They need to revisit their current business program and expand their offerings to the traditional concept of business education into a wider framework that follows education, incubation, mentoring, technology transfer, and research and development. With this in mind, the stakeholders of the work business and the industries have agreed on the theme for this year's meeting, which will now take place on the 25th of June as global collaborations with higher education to increase financial education. The week aims to contribute to the development of skills and expertise of students and faculty members, right? Assist in the digital transformation of higher education institutions and foster the kind of creative thinking that leads to innovation and eventual success in the ever-changing market environment of the 21st century. During this special day, all stakeholders and participants in the big events have been asked to reflect on their first test journey to analyze why business transformation is needed and how transformation and support and entrepreneurship and innovation that can boost economies. And to recreate how entrepreneurial ecosystems can create more jobs, more wealth, and more, more job social justice, more banking in place and very state in the market in the post pandemic economy. We are Business Angel Investors Week 2023. The future roundtable is that to provide a platform for entrepreneurs. Angel investors and academicians to explore the processes that have been brought through in post pandemic times. 
The week may also include discussions on the ongoing challenges entrepreneurial your venture studies and integrating the basic knowledge of strategic planning and new concept of creative ways to overcome our challenges. I would like to thank in advance all the stakeholders and partners who will be contributing to the work of this agent in the spring 2023. They will be highlighting the importance of higher education to increase financial inclusion, the theme of this year's event. I believe to grow and thrive in a post pandemic world, Smith Business Class Formation is a pandemic group organization and model is working. We are to sure ensure the sustainability of world economies in the near normal. I would like to thank the organizing committee and the colleagues who will be taking roles as company chairs, global partners, global speakers, and panel discussion members. Their combined effort will create value for the work startup economies, not only during this year, but in the future as well. They will focus on financing the collective knowledge of the world's most influential human leaders, policy makers, entrepreneurs, and artists, with a view to addressing critical issues of early stage equity markets in the new normal. The week will also be a great platform for you to campaign for solutions to such critical issues and other worldwide concerns at the United Nations, the European, and in the United countries. The ultimate goal of all of the week's keynotes, discussions, presentations, and workshops is to agree on a common roadmap for entrepreneurs, startups, and SMEs that will enable them to emerge from this pandemic area even stronger than they were before. We encourage all faculty members of higher education, educators, and entrepreneurs and policy makers to explore the merits of the work of this annual industry screen and take full advantage of its many benefits. I am confident that each part of the work of this annual industry screen will benefit from the collaborative ideas. Mobile education, training programs, and workshops, and global networking opportunities that are offered. I believe that by working together across borders with the common vision and smart dynamics in mind, we are that place to bring about positive change in the global economy. I also want to invite all of you to join the work progress of any investors. 2023, which will be in Durban of South Africa next November. I wish you a great success in your contributing dollars and thank you very much for listening to me. All the best. Well, uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, Bybers Altintas, for um, sharing. Uh, yeah, somebody is sharing their screen uh for for sharing these uh, few words so i would now uh, like to uh, open the floor for the co-hosts of today's event and i would like to start with uh, sandra so please just few opening uh, words from you and introduce yourself thank you thank you helena um just a brief introduction. As, as you mentioned, I'm a, a senator uh, for Slovenia and I'm also a board member of the Global Startup Committee. This, this year I'm presiding it and uh, it is uh, absolutely a pleasure uh, to be here to, to co-host and also to see colleagues uh, at this uh, event. Uh, and of course, to celebrate together the uh, World Business Angels Investors Week 2023. Uh, it was a little bit difficult to, to hear what Chairman uh, Bybars uh, mentioned, uh, but just to uh, uh, touch base again with the, the overall theme, which I think is very important. Uh, we focus this year on uh, collaboration with higher education uh, to, of course, increase the financial inclusion. And uh, this absolutely shows how much we're more aware of the need to connect, uh, uh, you know, the, the entrepreneurs, the academia, and of course the investors, uh, and uh, absolutely we're coming long ways. But still, you know, given the fact that we live in a very challenging times, we still need to uh, do uh, much much more. Uh, I'm uh, also a, a professor at the School of Economics and Business at the University of Ljubljana. 
And I can assure you, uh, as a matter of fact, that you know the the, the mindset of students, uh, you know, has also changed over the years. They're becoming more and more entrepreneurial, and they, of course, they, they demand more and more also from us educators as well. But also, you know, when they're uh, developing their business ideas, and we all know that many innovative business ideas come from young people, uh, we need to provide them with more. And uh, uh, all this suggests. Uh, that the higher education uh, uh, institutions need to take on the new role, entrepreneurs need to take on the new role, uh, and uh, we need to expand our business curricula uh, and the offerings beyond, beyond the traditional concepts of business education. Uh, at our school, we, have, we, we had for years the incubators, innovation, all-nighters for students, uh, but we definitely need to do more, and I'm happy to see this is happening and that the World Business Angels Investment Forum is also paying attention to this. Uh, and we, our goal, our joint goal should be to contribute to development of skills and expertise of students. And by developing their skills, we also uh, uh, force, uh, you know, develop our skills and absolutely we foster the, the creative thinking. Uh, I'm extremely happy to see all of you here and that uh, uh, we are all uh, coming eventually, you know, the academy, entrepreneurs, investors uh, at the, uh, to sit at the same table. And I wish you definitely a successful event today and absolutely throughout the, the entire week. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sandra. And uh, now moving forward with uh, Alexander Mastilovic. Thank you, Selena. Uh, uh, welcome and greetings to everyone who decided to join us today to discuss uh, about uh, not only investment, not only entrepreneurship, but also to discuss later about something what we named a smart society and how we can combine businesses, technology, uh, different stakeholders, government, uh, business, academia, uh, civil society sector, all to, to work all together actually to help us to uh, fulfill our mission to uh, create smart society. We'll a little bit talk more about smart cities also as a central point and maybe central pillar, pillar of smart society, an amazing platform where we can bring all stakeholders easily together to work there. Um, I'm Senator for Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm also a member of Global Science Technology Innovation Committee at WBF and also board member at Institute of Electrical Electronic Engineers, the world's largest professional organization and organization uh, which is actually famous everyone uh, because standards we are using every day like Wi-Fi, it's IT police standard 802.11 or Bluetooth and many other technological achievements actually are here because of the police. So I'm working mostly as engineer, but also I'm looking how to create bridges to all of you here, also to investors and how to actually support young people and innovative entrepreneurial ideas based on technologies to bring them into real market and help them actually to evolve and become successful companies. So that's from my side. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, I will use the opportunity to uh, ask our colleague Natalia Limonova, joining us from Ukraine, to uh, also say a few words. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to see you all and greetings from Ukraine. Uh, today it was a very hard night. We uh, we um, had a missile attack uh, from uh, Russia, but I'm here. It was loud and scared, but I'm happy to share our experience and our knowledge uh, to all of you. And I'm happy that you invite me to this uh, great community. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Sorry to hear uh, about the latest events, but very, uh, very warm welcome to our community. Uh, so, uh, Ivan Jovetic, going to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Helena, and it's my great pleasure to, to be here. And first of all, thank you, Sandra, for uh, initiating this second regional uh, cooperation. We had a blast uh, last year, so we will keep continuing. And of course, Thank you to Baibar Saltuntas, the chairman, for making this uh, happening uh, all these years. And 
And I think that this community is quite uh, interesting. And I think that this community can do a lot of a lot of different things. And it's really my honor again to be part of um, this event and other uh, WBAF -E events. I'm Ivan Jovetic and I'm coming from Montenegro, as uh, dear Helena mentioned. I'm a WBAF senator from Montenegro and Global South Africa Committee member. I'm also uh, a lecturer at the University of Donia Gorica, which is the biggest private university in the country, and member of the Arizona State University Alliance. Uh, and I'm also an entrepreneur, so this topic is quite appealing uh, to, to, to my heart. So I'm looking forward, and not just for this uh, event, but for more, more other events, because I think that the role of the universities when it comes to sparking the entrepreneurship is tremendous. But we will talk about that in the, in the next panel, and I don't want to uh, take uh, an additional time except to say hello to everyone, and it's my great pleasure to see you with us today, and I'm looking forward to very fruitful uh, talks and discussions, and looking forward to the 2024 event. Thank you, uh, Ivan, um, Alexander uh, Celeski, also our partner. Uh, hello, good afternoon good morning good evening everybody around the world uh so we are world business angel forum this uh world a uh, business investor week is is uh, broadcasted all over the world in different time zones so i wanna say uh, hello to everybody who is listening today or who is going to listen the the recordings later on uh, I'm coming from Macedonia, uh, international partner for WBA for several years and part of the startup committee also for a few years. Uh, coming from an entrepreneurship background, let's say, uh, all, the, uh, all the time in the, in the corporates, running my consultancy company and helping uh, entrepreneurs achieving their goals, uh, helping entrepreneurs, help, helping startups, connecting them with the right per uh, persons, right people on the right uh, right place. Uh, sometimes that's, uh, that's some um, uh, institution who is generating funds. Sometimes that is institution uh, who is providing uh, education. So everything is is going all together. There's there is no no any any fact that uh, so one thing can can be just for itself, and that's why I'm happy today that we can cover this this uh, uh, cross cutting topics that we will have in the next uh, next panels, especially in, in the panel number one for today. Um, I will. Uh, I hope that everybody will enjoy the the panelists, the topics that they will cover, the experience that they will share. Uh, seeing people here from uh, all around Europe, uh, bringing their their local but also international experiences and topics that they do. Hopefully, that it will be helpful for uh, as we are saying, our community second year in a row uh, doing the, the investor week on a regional uh, level, not uh, on just on national level, hopefully to, to continue many years more. Enjoy the event and uh, have a great day. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Just a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Helena Matusha. I run the WBF Croatia office, still the one and only WBF uh, national office in uh, Europe. I've been working with these wonderful colleagues for the past four years. Uh, some of my passions, I would say, is impact investing and initiating this entrepreneurial spark even was talking about uh, among high school students and even uh, higher education students. So I'm very glad that we have uh, the opportunity to um, talk about this topic on this year's uh, event. So before we start with the first panel discussion, a few of our housekeeping uh, remarks. Just please raise your hand if you want to share your thoughts or engage in the discussion. Please keep yourself muted while somebody else is uh, speaking. I do invite us all to respect the schedule we have and each other's time. And also feel free to comment in the chat area. 
So the first panel uh, will be moderated by Ivan uh, Jovetic, and then the second panel, without a break in between, will be moderated by uh, Alexander uh, Mastilovic. So thank you again for uh, joining us all, and I wish you all pleasant two, two hours that we have uh, together. Ivan, please start the, uh, the panel. Thank you, Chief Moderator, dear Helena. It's 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 an honor to continue uh, where you stopped. And again, uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, welcome to this first panel where we will talk uh, about the links uh, between education and entrepreneurship. As I told you in introduction words, I'm an entrepreneur for the past 17 years, and I have been almost the same period at uh, academia at a very specific uh, university. Uh, and we did, we test a lot of different uh, things. University of Donia Gorica has been founded in 2007, and we did a lot of different things, uh, creating, uh, we don't call it incubators, we call it uh, ideas factory and entrepreneurial nest, a different uh, pre-acceleration and acceleration programs, such as start, on, start, one, or start One Up, sorry. Then we have been creating uh, a stock exchange of entrepreneurial ideas, uh, a real pitch and funding event where students are pitching and the real business community uh, is um, funding those ideas and uh, it's in the competition. And in the last couple of years, trust me, we do, we do it on every May of 9th because that's the day of Europe and we want to con con connect these two things. And uh, uh, in the past, I think seven or eight years, we had on that May 9th, we had a bigger turnover than the Montenegrin Stock Exchange at the same day. So we are happy uh, about that. We are ex trying to expand in a different uh, fields, different projects. One of the things that we're currently doing is expanding uh, junior achievement uh, network in Montenegro because we want to have that spillover effect like Helena mentioned to the high school uh, pupils uh, and try to prepare them for for something something that will uh, come up to to their in their uh, faculty years by my opinion and I'm finishing with that the role of the universities is to tackle the way uh, how students think and the best uh, way to, according to my humble opinion, to, 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 to describe entrepreneurship is it is a philosophy, it is the way how you see the world, it is the way how you think. And having these two premises uh, next to each other, uh, at least uh, some of us can see a strong correlation between education and entrepreneurship. Unfortunately, things are not that easy, nor they are um, easily executed. So the successful examples of universities that are sparking entrepreneurial spirit are more exception than the rule. Therefore, I would like to welcome our distinguished uh, panelists that we have um, have today, uh, Ljubka Naumovska from uh, Northern Macedonia, coming from uh, René uh, School of Business, uh, an assistant professor. Ljubka, welcome. Uh, then Dimitar Jovevski, coming from Faculty of Economics, associate professor of uh, uh, Kirill Methodius University, again from North uh, Macedonia. Sasha Spasic, coming from uh, Croatia, an innovation strategist and business development consultant. And uh, Natalia Limonova, coming from Ukraine, she already addressed to us, but uh, she will keep talking in this panel, uh, coming as a founder of uh, GOIS. And uh, dear ladies and dear gentlemen, welcome to this panel. And um, I have a brief introductory question based on your uh, opinion. How do you, according to your uh, experience, how do you see this like an intro question, how do you see this uh, potential cooperation between universities and entrepreneurs? What would be the, the, the most um, advisable things, the most common things to do or not to do? Uh, I propose uh, to go to the same, uh, in the same order like it's in the, in the agenda. So Ljubka, the floor is yours, then Dmitry, Sasha and Natalia, if this is okay with, with you. If not, you can skip or you can aggregate the questions. So the only thing we have to do is to finish at four. Ljubka, please, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ivan, for this nice introduction. Um, and thank you, Alexander Zelensky, for inviting me to this so needed forum and uh, urgent panel, I would say, and for giving me the opportunity to, to speak with you, to share and exchange. 
And the question is, uh, probably we are late discussing on that. I think the industry and the education should have started collaborated at least two decades ago. Not that they haven't, but not to the level that uh, especially the new generation deserve to. So if you're hearing some sounds from the background, I cannot remove my dog from the room. So it's just a nice <laughs> part. If he or she is an entrepreneur, it's fine. She's French, so no. <laughs> She's very comfortable in her French lifestyle. So let me share my screen so you, I can visualize my thoughts if possible. Okay. Uh, 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 okay. And let me know if I'm doing the thing right. I haven't used Zoom for a while. Can you see my screen? Yes. Wonderful. So as I mentioned, I'll, I'll be happy to talk on this topic, but uh, I will answer the question in the next five minutes by structuring the answer into several chapters. Uh, what is the issue about the educational system now? What are the competencies approach that is as approach as an system is highly used in Western Europe, especially in France. It's not a suggestion, but it's actually an obligation now. The mindset of the new generation of students, the importance of interdisciplinarity, but also intersectorality. And I'm gonna mention a few things about how the School of Business has been advancing in its teaching innovation and what what thing, what thing kind of activities have uh, taken this school being highly ranked in the European uh, rankings for business schools. Uh, as I mentioned, my as you introduced me nicely, I am uh, Lyubka Nomoska, I am Macedonian, but I live for the last three years in France, uh, more precisely in Rennes. And these are my thoughts on the educational system. I think it's been highly dominated by two major factors, the mindset of Gen Z and the technological revolution that is, has been changing medicine, has been changing the way we talk, has been changing the way we order food, has been changing the across all industries more or less, and certainly has been tackling the educational system. But in order to respond well, the educational system, especially the higher educational system, has already introduced several changes. First of all, learning by doing or practice central learning, where even in the curriculum, even in the syllabi, uh, companies, enterprises are being more and more involved. When I say company and enterprises, I don't refer to cases, use cases by books by Coca-Cola and Nike, but I'm referring to small companies, middle-sized companies, struggling companies, rebranded companies, even startups that are part of the curriculum. More and more critical thinking has been encouraged, flipped classrooms, debates, teamwork, especially gamification and the more and uh, use of apps and tools. This is uh, leading me to the, to the next point, which is uh, very typical for the French educational system on, in higher education. It is no longer, uh, there is no option uh, to, to choose even selective courses now. If you want to study master in France, probably you will not be left to have elective courses. And the answer why is because uh, it is the government slash the industry and their updated reports who give us the hints, what are the required skills on the market? So those kind of skills are being called competences they are transformed into a learning objectives. Out of the learning objectives, we are quantifying them into ECATES plus hours as usual, but then there are, we are uh, breaking them down into skills, learning topics that are being measured by actual exams. In Within the exam, there will be instruments for measurement of the competencies. So at the end, it is not the selection of the professor, not the program director, not even the dean, what kind of courses and what will be taught in the courses. It is the selection of an institution called France Competence or Competencies, Institution for Competencies that is updated and it's measuring the competencies across all industries and it's indicating if you wanna have your diploma certificated, if you wanna have a double D diploma or you have, if you want to enjoy the, the highest standards in education, you need to respect the competencies uh, approach. That provides for sure a logical learning journey that lowers the level of overlaps, lowers the level of theory, especially frameworks and models that are outdated and really focuses the learning into something that is at this moment required. As you can imagine, this is not often well accepted by all professors. 
uh, educational um, people who work in education, especially the PhDs, do have an ego that doesn't kind of line up with this system. But we are in the process of transformation. But I can tell you for sure, I've been working on this for two years, and it's absolutely amazing. I'm also uh, I'm not only professor of uh, marketing in the School of Business, but I'm also the program director of one of the master programs, if not the biggest one. And we have been doing this for two years and our level of employability of students immediately after graduation, which means immediately six months, is at this point 96%. So the system is, is, is uh, beyond incredible. The following topic that I mentioned briefly at the beginning will be definitely, we cannot continue talking about education and entrepreneurship without mentioning the mindset of the new generation of students. As Sandra mentioned at the beginning, and even as well, we are definitely in a, in a time zone where the new generation is bringing a lot of new characteristics, is introducing uh, new chapters in life, is dealing with different kinds of communication between them and with us. They are extremely tech savvy. They have extremely high IQ, maybe the highest ever measured in the history of humankind. But at the same time, with a very poor emotional intelligence, very poor reading habits, very short attention span, which can be afterwards tackled with uh, gamification as a tool that a lot of business schools and universities are currently using it in the curriculum. And finally, uh, this guides me to the next slide, which confirms the topic of this panel, which means that we are in the stage where we need to do not only interdisciplinarity in the level of university, but also intersectorality where we should absolutely merge the governmental work, the industry, the academia, but also the NGOs at the same level. And so we can produce one blended, flourishing and um, successful educational system. What is impacting this intersectorality? Of course, the technology, chat GPT, the TikTokization of brands, even the most serious brands went to TikTok. We have to acknowledge these movements the power of the influencers, not only the celebrities and the macro influencers, but also the power of the micro influencers, the time spent on social media that hasn't been lowered since the biggest peak of COVID in 2020. We have to acknowledge this stuff. And we have to sit down and confirm that absolutely everything is connected with everything. And we're all slowly but surely becoming programmers. On the level of the school that, by the way, has been uh, claimed to be the, the most international business school in Europe in 2019 and 2016, and we're trying to get the same certification for this year. We have uh, over 70 nationalities in the campus. More than 90% of the professors are non-French. We have five research centers, 18 master programs, um, bachelor program, of course, but also we have postdoc and PhD. And the school is being accredited by AMBA, by Equis and AACSB. So this is what we normally do to merge, to, to create intersectorality and to, 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 to innovate the teaching methods and to increase entrepreneurship across students. One thing I just was just reading before joining this meeting is that when we talk about the entrepreneurial mindset, there's a huge difference how entrepreneurs are growing on Eastern Europe and Western Europe. So there is a big difference and we are becoming entrepreneurs out of necessity or out of opportunity. So knowing that I, I am currently speaking on the behalf of Western European country, I must say that here, um, it is an entrepreneurial country for sure, but the anxiety that I could, I could experience myself because I was an uh, entrepreneur in Macedonia uh, too for almost 10 years, it doesn't exist. People here become entrepreneurs to achieve more than they already have. And Eastern Europe is typically, and the entrepreneurial mindset is being born by necessity, often by a necessity. Also, the statistics shows that the gender gap for the entrepreneurs in Western Europe is lower than in Eastern Europe. So there is a significant difference in the reasoning why people become entrepreneurs, how they grow their inter enterprise or company in future, and there's a further question of equality and uh, inclusion. In order to encourage entrepreneurial mindset, but also to involve innovation into our teaching, we are by default involving serious games as a part of the curriculum. 
We are avoiding teaching by big and boring company cases like Nike, Coca-Cola, Adidas, and uh, Decathlon, but we are involving case studies by startups, companies that failed or almost failed, small companies, middle-sized companies, local companies, sometimes companies who are struggling or companies who do not have, let's say, budget for marketing, so the students will work a project for them. Uh, as per demand by the students, we are involving the reality into the classroom by avoiding boring and outdated case studies by the book. On another note, we are strongly encouraging students to student mentoring, which is now becoming a very structural form. As students are coming with different backgrounds and different skills generated in their previous education, we have to acknowledge that there is a huge skill gap when it comes to master, especially in marketing or any other very niche program. We are involving introduction of programming into absolutely every program. Marketing, finance, management, organization, geopolitics, they all study programming now. Uh, of course, there is already since three, four years ago, a system for online or hybrid learning, which is not only uh, letting students to see that the, the, the session afterwards, they, should be, they, they can be involved as they're in the classroom. There is coded simulation applications, especially for stock exchange markets. There is a huge collaboration, not only with companies, but also NGOs, especially NGOs dedicated for Ukrainian uh, refugees at this point. And of course, with partnership, official partnerships with local and international companies, as per my case, uh, marketing agency who have obligation to dedicate a certain number of hours and time for being with the students in the classroom. And last but not least, we have e introduced Incubator, I think in 2018, I'm not so sure, oh, sorry, 2014, that is called InnoStar. And I will be more involved in this project starting from September, but it's work working quite well and it's encouraging students to, 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 to propose the ideas to the incubator. The incubator is accepting only 10 solutions per year and is nurturing them um, basically from zero and scratch. And it's being part of one of the master programs for now, but now it's extending to all other master programs. So I will be finishing now and letting uh, let Dimitar and uh, the other people in the panel uh, mention their opinion, but I will be happy to take questions either now or later. And I'm a strong believer in gamification. So I'm gonna close this speech with this wonderful, wonderful saying by Albert Einstein, who said, play is the highest form of research. And it certainly is. So thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you very much, especially for the last quote and all the things you shared with us. Um, Dimitar, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, and um, it is a pleasure to be here. And uh, Mr. Tsileski, thank you for the invitation to be part of uh, World Business Angel Forum. Greetings to everybody, to all, all the ambassadors and all uh, who are uh, watching us. My name is Dimitar Yoski. I'm coming from uh, Faculty of Economics. I'm an associate professor there where I teach uh, digital marketing, social media marketing, uh, design, uh, and web. And uh, um, my faculty is a part of uh, one big university. Uh, the biggest in the country, the highest ranked in the country, which is uh, 74 years old, uh, with a lot of um, units uh, inside. Um, I'm, I'm coming from a typical um, old uh, school, old type of university. I, I'm not coming from applied science uh, uh, university or a business school. Um, and uh, in my case, compare what uh, Lubka mentioned before, we have uh, different challenges uh, uh, regarding uh, even to your question, how to bring closer the entrepreneurs uh, uh, to the university or how to, to integrate uh, the entrepreneur mindset uh, in the university syllabus curricula and so on and so back. Um, uh, since I mentioned that I'm coming uh, from a really, really big, uh, really um, uh, bureaucratic university, um, there is a lot of challenges that we need to overcome in order to implement all the, all the, uh, let's say, all the fast-moving uh, uh, 
all the fast moving changes that are uh, around us uh, from a, a learning point of uh, view, where the, the, the education or, or also the knowledge is uh, becoming obsolete after a few years, uh, depending on um, the field we are talking about. From one side, uh, the other side is to, let's say, to, to, to make the infrastructure of, you know, of a university big as mine, to be flexible and agile in order to implement different types of uh, programs. So um, on, a, on a level of, uh, on, a, on a university level, I can say that we have um, three center for technology transfers on a different um, uh, units, one accelerator, uh, sorry, founded uh, 2019, uh, it's called Business Accelerator, one incubator, which is far more older than this um, accelerator. And we have uh, three different um, laboratories that, that are for fabrication and for um, testing some ideas. That's something on, on a university level, but uh, speaking from for my, um, my uh, 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 faculty, uh, which is the uh, uni is a part of that uh, university. Uh, as addition on this, we have um, um, since uh, 2020, uh, we open a, a Yonus Center, um, a center for uh, social entrepreneurship. We're doing a lot of um, a lot of different things regarding the to, to incorporate uh, the entrepreneurial uh, mindset, uh, enter, bringing closer entrepreneurship to the education and the students. Um, from a Point of view, what you even ask as a as a question, um, what uh, how we can do or how I I believe that is the right way. Uh, we need to to make uh, to align the entrepreneurial mindset or entrepreneurial entrepreneurs from the business sector uh, close to the university since yesterday. So. It's a must. It's a, not a question. It's something that is uh, need to be happening on a on a, uh, on a daily basis. Uh, that's really important uh, due to the fact I completely agree with Luca based on the, the mindset of the generation, the Z generation that we are educating at the moment, and also what uh, regarding the, the technology is uh, evolving uh, uh, around us. So we don't have time to lose and we need to, 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 to be proactive and agile in order to, to uh, make uh, that uh, thing closer. What we are doing from uh, our perspective at, uh, at my uh, faculty, uh, we have one, uh, one center for social entrepreneurship where each year we have five hackathons uh, where we are, uh, we are taking some small companies, uh, uh, they want to do some social entrepreneurship and the students are, are, are uh, are developing ideas for their problems and uh, presenting in front of them. And they have some, receiving some awards in order to, to start uh, together with those companies to, uh, to, to generate something. Uh, on the other, on the other hand, um, due to the, uh, as some of previous, uh, previous uh, panelists mentioned, and also I think Sandra mentioned uh, at their university, if, if you're uh, defending some kind of uh, um, uh, accreditation as, as a university, you need to make your uh, curriculum uh, according to that accreditation. Uh, and you need to have a real case uh, insight, uh, business cases. You need to have um, a lot of um, uh, involvement from uh, companies and the business sector uh, uh, in the curriculum. And uh, in Macedonia is the case that we have a law that uh, every student from the second year of um, their studying, then they are obliged to have uh, an internship uh, at least one month uh, in order to um, sign up for the next semester. Without that, they cannot uh, sign up for the next semester. All those measures, all those activities are bringing uh, an entrepreneurs uh, and an entrepreneurship mindset uh, close to the students. But that's, uh, that's not enough. Um, um, on the other side, uh, myself as an as a associate uh, professor, but also as an entrepreneur, uh, I have a company uh, which is up and running for more than 10 years with 50 plus employees. Um, we need to work constantly on the, with the young generations uh, in order to, to make uh, closer to them uh, all the opportunity they can use especially especially in the early stage of uh, development of, of one startup. I'm talking about pre-seed phase, I'm talking about uh, pre-incubation phase. So all those aspects, um, we need to make them ready 
uh, to make them uh, legible how to write a business plan, how to uh, create something in order to go to the next phase, uh, to, to go to some incubator, to go some accelerator, when to apply for uh, funds and uh, um, to see the, the light of the day as a, as a, as a entrepreneurs. Uh, that's something that is happening through the formal um, channels uh, in, in my country, at my university. And uh, uh, sometimes we are really good in that, but sometimes we are lacking or missing something. And we need to work more on, on, on that side, something that uh, I think is really important to establish entrepreneur mindset from the beginning. And I will close uh, 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 my expose uh, with uh, a few thoughts that I, I'm at the university for, I think, yeah, more than 15 years. And I'm in love with the entrepreneurship mindset uh, from the beginning. And each year, at 1st of October, when I, when I meet with students, and each year there are 300 plus students um, at my lectures, ask them, please raise your hand how many uh, of you are going after finishing. I'm, I'm, I'm starting um, in the second year of my lectures, um, second year students. And I ask my students uh, from those 300, uh, how many of you are going to start your own business after finishing the, the university? 15 years ago, uh, at least, I don't know, 20%, maybe max up to 30% will raise the hand. This year, this year, actually last year, sorry, when I asked them, more than a half, maybe 60, 70% raise the hand that they will start uh, uh, their own business after finishing as well. And that's exactly what Dubka also mentioned. I think Sandra touched in, 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 in the beginning that uh, we need to work with those students and to, to encourage them through the formal education process to, to, to plant a seed in their minds about entrepreneurship and uh, uh, what they should do and how to continue with their business, uh, with their uh, career after finishing university. So thank you uh, for this opportunity and my time and I will uh, pass the ball to the, to the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much. Sasha, the floor is yours. Thank you. My name is Sasha Spasic. I'm coming from Croatia. I'm innovation strategist and brand strategist. I'm focused mostly on differentiating uh, strategies for developing uh, companies and uh, for uh, corporations. Uh, I'm doing mostly business in the sense that uh, I I'm helping uh, C-level executives to design and execute better strategy that resonate with the real bank customers. Uh, I have a good uh, educational background. Uh, I'm curious about everything that's happening all around the world and have uh, almost 40 different certifications as several MBA studies. And uh, regarding the question, the strong partnership, in my opinion, between entrepreneurs and academia can create a virtuous cycle of innovation and success driving uh, economic growth and societal progress. And uh, we, can that, we can see a potential for post innovation and entrepreneurial success in uh, several fields and several ways. That's mostly that academia often leads uh, frontier of uh, interrogatory research, while entrepreneurs are the guys who are uh, doing that uh, excel in practical implementation. Uh, so university and research institutions can offer mostly fresh, innovative ideas and concepts as theories, while entrepreneurs can translate them into uh, actionable, marketable products or services or new businesses. Uh, another thing that is uh, universities can provide uh, substantial uh, access to resources, including labs, uh, cutting edge technologies, intellectual capital. The, uh, so entrepreneurs can leverage these resources for their businesses. It's also important that uh, entrepreneurs can find young and passionate, uh, passionate, highly educated, talented people from all over the universities. That is a sense of talent acquisition. Collaborations may also include experienced academics who have deep domain expertise that is valuable to the uh, entrepreneurial ventures. Uh, it's also in the sense that uh, you can easily uh, find uh, uh, funding and the collaborating with an established academic institution can 
enhance some kind of entrepreneur's credibility that can be much easier to attract investors or create partnerships and securing funding. Uh, entrepreneurs can tap also into the broad network of academia, which often includes alumni, faculty, industry professionals, other entrepreneurs, uh, all kinds of uh, networking uh, uh, people and opportunities because uh, uh, students uh, can be highly motivated to to make uh, more startups today than ever before because everything is different almost uh, every 10 years. 10 years ago, it, it wasn't uh, possible uh, as today that everything mit mitigated online and we have more than uh, ever digital platforms and uh, online schools, online courses, and everything is much more online than before because of technology and possibilities. Uh, also, many universities can run incubators and accelerators to nurture startups, offering resources like mentorship programs, workshops, seed fundings, and other different opportunities. And it's important, in my opinion, that uh, we can talk about many different educational programs that uh, it can be possible to develop with uh, entrepreneurs for their real market needs and to know the customer better and the process better and to give uh, entrepreneurs what, uh, what the real uh, business demand is. That's my opinion in short. Sorry, I was muted. Sorry again. Thank you, Sasha, very much. Uh, Natalia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, hi, everyone again. Uh, I introduced myself as Ukrainian, but didn't mention about my experience. Uh, I'm a founder of uh, Impact at Text Startup Global Innovative Online School. From the other side, I'm a mentor for startups in EO Business Incubator from the USA. Uh, also, I'm a member, board member of STEM Coalition. Uh, I think you know what is STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. And uh, also, I'm a board member of WBF, Global Startup Committee. And I have 23 years of entrepreneurship experience uh, and founded uh, several businesses, our family business, and then uh, uh, the network of offline uh, private schools in Ukraine. And I have two successful exits, and I'm happy to share my experience to other people. Uh, I want to start from the role of education in general. Uh, Otto von Bismarck said that wars are not won by generals, but by school teachers and priests. And I agree with him. Uh, all you know that a bloody war is going on in Ukraine against an evil state that is trying to destroy Ukrainians and occupy our lands. Uh, but even um, under such conditions, even after tonight, uh, when more than 30 missiles and drones uh, were launched at our peaceful cities, uh, even uh, after, uh, even under such, all these conditions, about 2,000 uh, uh, Ukrainian teachers and educators will meet tomorrow in Ukrainian city Lviv to discuss the modernization of our educational system because we understand the importance of this. Uh, the question of entrepreneurship education will be the one on, of the agenda. Um, Ukrainian now, Ukraine now support uh, the development of the startup ecosystem. Our uh, vice prime minister of education and digital transformation see Ukraine as an innovative and technology hub, hub of Europe in nearest future. Our state Ukrainian startup fund is the biggest investor in Ukrainian startups. 
uh, we, we have already brought to the world five unicorns, two decacorns and eight prospective unicorns. And uh, I think we will continue uh, to develop such uh, great companies. And I sincerely believe in entrepreneurship mindset. Uh, thank you, Luca, for, uh, for your mention of gamification and modern type of education. I'm ambassador of such type of education. I know that our kids were born in the digital age and they are completely uninterested in all school materials. They can't focus their attention for more than one minute in a row. Uh, that's why uh, gamification, animation, and uh, um, uh, the learning by doing, learning, learning by playing is the best way to create new entrepreneurs in, in globally, not only in our country. And um, our startups now uh, can show the example of resilience. Uh, because we are not only survived during the war, we scale our projects to the international markets. Last year, I participated and visited more than eight countries uh, uh, with our digital uh, educational platform and share our experience uh, to, to all entrepreneurs. And I'll be happy to share it with you. Thank you again for inviting me. It's me again. Thank you very much. Uh, we've been very fruitful. So we have uh, four minutes uh, left uh, for this panel. If I can ask one more question for you in these remaining four to five minutes, just giving me a one element briefly. If you can pick just one element for a very fruitful and efficient cooperation between universities and uh, entrepreneurs, what it would be? Just one element. And briefly, of course, Lubka. Can you paraphrase the question? Just one element, very short, one element uh, that is the most beneficial for cooperation between universities and entrepreneurs. I would say um, proactive and entrepreneurial minded professors like Dimitar, for example. If the professors do not have the mindset of entrepreneurs, they don't have to be necessarily entrepreneurs. It's extremely difficult to play the both games. So, but they have to have the mindset. Otherwise, nothing will work. Not governmental projects, not NGO projects, not your project. So I would say entrepreneurial mindset at professors. Thank you very much. Dimitar, even though oh, she but... she 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 somehow announced you, you're in line. Yeah. So yeah 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 I, I don't have problem with the mindset so for me that's granted i would say uh, agile uh, approach uh, for the both sides that's really important Behind, beside mindset which is important but also to be flexible adjustable use every opportunity because everything is really fast changing and uh, the entrepreneurship cannot wait for uh, approval of some government and so on thank you very much sasha what's your one pick first at the draft just the mic. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll, I'll bet on uh, the mentorship program that will educate uh, startups or somebody that uh, go to market and test uh, on the real buying customer whatever business or products or whatever you have to test that you get uh, real feedback uh, as soon as possible and that you can fail fast fail cheap and fail forward and that is the most important in my opinion because uh, if you are uh, losing time or money or you you invest a year or two years for something that will fail on marketing in weeks or days or uh, in best way months so you are misallocating your resources and you're doing the things wrong so it's go to market strategy that uh, real buying customers and the market feedback is the most important thing in my opinion thank you very much natalia your first pick 
Uh, I think that uh, collaboration between academia and industry should be increased. Uh, uh, businesses and corporations should be encouraged uh, to invest uh, in researchers and implementation of this and to give real tasks uh, to students. Uh, I, I can call it uh, dual uh, education, uh, learning by doing. Thank you. Uh... I have just one minute to, to wrap it up. That's one of my favorite things to do when it comes to uh, moderation, because it shows whether I was listening to you or not. But uh, let's hope I was uh, quite, quite a good listener to you. Uh, from my point of view, the things you have said can be wrapped up in, in, in for, for a couple of topics. And I will give that as a, as a form of potential conclusion. So networking is a must. Uh, both sides must be flexible, must do uh, things fast and cheap, like Sasha said uh, at the end. Uh, we must have uh, real life cases and uh, market testing uh, all the time uh, present. We must have a mindset on both sides, especially including uh professors because they are the ones that can or cannot spark the thing uh then there is a necessity that both sides need to learn from each other entrepreneurs from education or educators and educators from entrepreneurs and then uh students must test entrepreneurship whether in the forms of companies and internships sorry or by my opinion, more favorably in the forms of their own startups that will uh, comprehend all the things that you mentioned. Uh, one of the two last things, first, uh, the necessity from both sides to understand the needs and the mindset of new generation. And of course, the last but not least, the mindset and readiness to play all the time. Thank you, for Lubka, for sparking this play element. And dear ladies and dear gentlemen, it was my sincere pleasure to have you on this panel. And thank you very much for it. And I'm now exactly at 4 o'clock passing the floor to our dear Alexander Mastilovich to continue with panel number two. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan. Actually, we can continue. Uh... I have to just to clarify, unfortunately, two of my panelists are not able to attend today. So we will actually redesign our scenario and format of discussion. But I'm pretty sure that my colleague David and I, we can actually carry the key takeaways from the topic on smart cities and smart society, because it's not something what is so difficult to explain. Uh, I just uh, want to use this opportunity to explain a little bit uh, the meaning of smart because we are very common, the victims of marketing and many things actually are named with prefixes smart, but it's actually not true. For the very beginning, I want to cite uh, the Andre Eng, who said that actually in these ages of incoming actually uh, artificial intelligence, it's not who has the best algorithm to win. It's who, who has the most data. And everything is about, about gathering data from different sources. We can do it using uh, sensors to deploy massive amount of sensors in our cities, in our factories, in our home appliances, actually in our buildings to collect data, to analyze, segment this data, to, to, to find some cross correlations, to find causalities between uh, different uh, values of parameters, and then we can find some additional value, additional knowledge, and then we can support actually decision making to optimize resource usage, uh, to optimize our processes, not only in the cities, but also in villages, in everyday life. Uh, smart cities and smart society is not only about technology. Everyone who believes that, uh, that technology can solve all our problems actually, that person uh, don't uh, doesn't understand actually uh, what is technology and what uh, kind of challenges we are facing right now in the, in the world. So uh, for any topic, including smart societies and smart cities, it's very important to, to, to check three layer model for everything what we want to discuss today. It's first thing is technologies. Uh, we have to be sure that we have uh, technology to carry on uh, the, the problem and, and, and the vision how we can solve our problems. Then it's operational level as a second one. Operational level is always about business, about uh, capexes, about opexes, about these things. 
because we always have to bring money together with uh, technological solutions to see uh, if we can find a proper place for investment and uh, for entrepreneurial action. And then, of course, the third layer may be a little bit uh, sensitive, but it's political level because it's not only about political decision making, but also about uh, legislation and regulation and uh, policies related to to uh, new technologies and, and data gathering. So all of you are aware, I'm pretty sure, about GDPR and protection of, of uh, personal information. Then it's very important to understand limitations of artificial intelligence. And we need to be very ethical in uh, artificial intelligence applications. Uh, we are uh, uh, witnesses of G, uh, chat GPT, uh, let's say, breakthrough uh, and i think this year in technological world is colored by chat gpt but just to, to be clear it's nothing uh, super new but it's it's for the first time it's something what is um bring it to the people regular people non 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 engineering people some tools like that i saw these things many years ago but in some close environments data centers etc so um Smart society, smart cities, uh, this is some uh, very short introduction, but I also would like to invite uh, my colleague David Pavlovsky to join me here in this discussion. I, I believe that we will discuss in some kind of fireside chat, chat. You can ask me, I can ask you. It's going to be more dynamic and more interesting for our audience. So uh, I would like to hear your thoughts. On, on, on these topics. And of course, uh, you can ask me as well as I, I can ask you about uh, uh, how, how we actually see this. And I, I also uh, want uh, to, to invite everyone actually to ask us and to create a little bit more dynamic uh, discussion in this panel, uh, because it's very, very fruitful uh, topic for all of us. Uh, David, yeah. are you there? I, yes, I'm here, I'm here. So basically, I would like first introduce myself. So we're within the concept of smart cities. So basically, every uh, the idea, our idea is to solve the currently unsolved problem of last mile. So basically, we're doing the logistics. Uh, as, as we already know, that it's almost impossible to change the layout of the cities. It's impossible to change the infrastructure of the city. So that's why we decide to use the current or existing infrastructure in order to solve one of the biggest pain in the logistics, in logistics. So it's called last mile. But how we do it? So basically we are using the current infrastructure of people who are on every corner of the city and give them an opportunity like Uber to deliver items within the cities. So basically we are using people mobility to deliver items at the end point. Uh, the concept of smart cities, it's a part uh, we are engaged. So basically we are doing that in several CE cities as we would like to, to show that uh, that will be transitional period. So it's impossible to put the robot droids and everything and to change the layout. Uh, it requires enormous investment and those cities like we are living, these old cities are not built for this kind of efficiency, what we'd like to do. Maybe the new cities like Neom or others, we, we will be, it will be built in that efficient way and it will be optimized for these kind of, of things. So, uh, yeah, so the concept itself is uh, completely correlated with the people habits. So in our industry currently, the number of parcels or the volumes of parcels are doubled every two years, which means that it will become a huge problem for the current infrastructure of the city. So that's why it requires great technology. But as you already mentioned, the data is most important because in our case, it's the same. It's not about the algorithm itself. It's about the data or the relevance of the data what we'll, we are collecting. So we are collecting every single data like habits, like purchasing power, like uh, parcel, type of parcels, type of people who are uh, ordering or delivering or sending parcels. So that will help uh, the most, especially for the urbanization of the cities or of the other part of the cities, because you know, if you know that this kind of supply or demand is happening in some uh, part of the city, then you will develop that kind of city. If you need, or you have some kind of bottleneck, you can solve that bottleneck because we will have the relevant data. So that's our input in that smart city concept. And yeah, there are other, other things which can be on the next phase. So basically we are thinking about uh, building the 
the technology based or building the hardware like droids and drones and that require iot which is a huge, crucial part of of uh, smart city because it needs interconnectivity basically you need to transfer data in, in some ways i would like to ask you about uh, uh do you have any already implemented uh, solution and uh, i also want to ask you about uh, uh, which kind of data and parameters you find uh, relevant for decision making process in your application because I'm pretty sure that actually the prefix smart is always about data metering and uh, application advanced mathematical algorithm uh, on collected data like artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, things like that. So maybe you can share some uh, use case if you have something and maybe you, some feedback if you can from that implementation or if not, uh, do you have anything uh, in uh, planned actually soon to deploy or to pilot somewhere? Um, do you have issues and challenges to find financing for that? And maybe your experience from contact local administration, do you have support? Uh, I'm very interested if local administration understands uh, actually uh, benefits, potential benefits from smart city application. Just your yeah. experience from the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, uh, the the reality what we are facing, especially in Southeast Europe, is that there is a very hard access to finance, especially in these uh, stages where the, you don't have a viable product. Now we have because we are working three years, and we are not working only in, in Skopje, Macedonia. We are work, We have worked in Croatia. We have worked with the biggest post in Croatia. It's French post. It's DPD. So we work a year and a half there. And uh, now we are working here in Macedonia with four biggest companies in their vertical. So basically we're working with biggest pharmaceutical companies called Zegen, which were present in Serbia as well. We have worked now with Tikvesh and we are now working with Ananas. We will start work with Ananas, the biggest e-commerce. So basically, yeah, we have a perfect use case and the data we are collecting, the most relevant data from the standpoint of uh, why or are the people now prepared to, to receive parcels for a, a person who is not, um, branded it's yes because we have already delivered 10,000 parcels and we've seen that that's not an obstacle the most important decision making point or data which is needed for the people is that the availability of the product first and second how fast it will come to your doorstep so we are now trying to 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 uh like educate people that uh, it's impossible if there's a high density of, of parcels or the enormous volume of parcels, the doorstep is not the reliable option like it, they are used to because you know the optimization of the last mile delivery until today was made only next day delivery. So whatever you're ordering, not only Macedonia, everywhere in the world, everything is the next day. It's not the same day. We are pushing towards with by using our technology to make delivery of parcel in less than 30 minutes on the areas which th th that is possible or as fast as possible. So until now, we have succeeded to reach the, the framework of two hour delivery, which is great. So the relevance, yeah, the point is that the people outside are not as they, they, they are, look, it's a uh, like conventional wisdom that people are expecting that uh, people are trying to make uh, errors. No, it's not like that. So people are very fair, almost. Uh, the, the people which are delivering items are not prone to, to steal the items, are not uh, like used to make a, a big errors, which means that now it's come a time that uh, the ordinary people or the crowdsource can be engaged in these uh, deliveries of parcel, which is perfectly good for us, for the concept what we are trying to provide. And I think that the biggest uh, like influence on that has the Airbnb or Uber when you're driving with someone you don't know or you are leaving goals in some apartment on the person you don't know. So that's by a stranger equal, equal danger have been overcome even though in, in here in Southeast Europe, which is great. The data points which are relevant for us, it's uh, the type of parcels which are delivered. We find out that like almost the same same uh, like uh, size which are delivered by, by Amazon. So I will give some data. Uh, all, Amazon uh, have delivered approximately 7.5 billion parcels every single year. 86% of the parcels on Amazon platform are below three kilos and on the distance uh, short than three, three kilometers, which means that uh, the density of the city is very important. And that's why we, we have tried or, or we are now delivering by the most common or the ways which are more, more focused on green, like walk, uh, bike or scooter.
So we are forcing people and incentivize them. It's perfect. Actually, that's that's a great story. It's, it sounds very optimistic, and and, and uh, I, I I didn't know actually for your project, and I'm so glad to hear that actually something like that happening here in the in the Balkan area because. Usually I see these things uh, uh, piloting somewhere, usually in the United States, even not in Europe. So it's it's very, very, very great to hear that actually we become uh, this advantage uh, uh, level of, of technology application in, in, in urban areas, and actually improving the urban experience and urban living at all. So I will also, uh, I'm also inspired by your, by your talk and I will share some, uh, one use case I delivered uh, in, 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 in uh, East Sarajevo actually in 2016, maybe a few years before, uh, most of people start talking in this area about smart cities. I used the opportunity that at that moment I was in USA working at uh, the Rutgers University. So I, I had the opportunity actually to collaborate on some smart city project from the perspective of uh, smart city as the best application and best uh, business proof of concept for 5G deployment. Actually, the, my primary research and science part of my, my career was related to 5G, but 5G is very expensive project, not only about macro base station, but also uh, most of you, are, I'm pretty sure you're aware that actually 5G architecture uh, considered uh, that we need to deploy uh, many micro cells, uh, something similar like Wi-Fi access points, every 100, 200 meters, working on microwave bands, like 24 uh, gigahertz uh, in Europe or 72 uh, gigahertz in USA, uh, with very, very uh, possibility to, to reach actually uh, fiber optic uh, feed rates uh, to, to transfer that we are able actually to transfer HD or 4K TV multimedia or real-time gaming, but also to support billions of sensors, uh, very high density deployed sensors in, in small areas, actually, and we need uh, uh, microsense. So what I did here, with, with very limited infrastructure in Bosnia, of course, it was smart lighting. Uh, that was actually a small pilot project funded by European Union uh, Committee of Regions. Uh, it was part of Green Growth Fund, actually mostly um, focused on energy efficiency. What we decided actually to decrease the light pollution in, in urban areas and also to save some energy because as all of you are aware that uh, public lights actually uh, uh, emitting 100% uh, power even in night, uh, not, not pedestrians, no cars, especially in some uh, residential areas out of city, city centers. So no tourism activity, no parties, nothing. Uh, we are spending energy and actually we are disturbing biodiversity, natural cycles of sleeping, uh, we're disturbing animals, plants, everything. So we decided to, 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 to define the problem, how to actually uh, decrease the power in a few steps, but also to minimize the number of power transitions because actually every transition damaging bulbs and actually causing another kind of cost. So we want to check actually the habits of people during different parts of years. Actually in summer, people walking a little bit longer than in winter, you know, daylight is longer, many different things, weekends versus work days. And then we collect a pretty significant amount of data for analyzing and at the end of story actually and this at this uh, pedestrian uh, area we uh, optimize the system to save actually 49% uh, of energy uh, after 6 months algorithm actually becomes stable and we are currently now saving approximately 50% of the energy so that was uh, just uh, the purpose for uh, Actually, the, the purpose of this project was uh, to, to, to create a proof of concept to help us actually to convince local administration, local decision makers to invest because uh, return of investment is without any risk, it's just depending on the uh, energy price uh, at stocks and the return of investment is between one to four years. But of course, for the government sector, uh, return of investment is not a critical goal. Actually, objective is to pro provide the best services to citizens the best as possible, of course. And um, this is something what could be a great business model for uh, for the investment. I also would like to, to underline the uh, opportunity, for example, to launch smart waste management, 
what is actually the basic point to start recycling uh, and circular economy to motivate people to recycle, to, to, to organize some kind of gamification, to give citizens some kind of awards. If you re recycle, you will get some, I don't know, points, city points, and then when you collect, I don't know, 10 city points, maybe you can use these points for free uh, public trans transportation ride or free parking or et cetera, et cetera. So this is some close circle economy in the urban areas, but we can actually involve, involve the broader broader audience. I would, I would like to hear uh, uh, from you also, how you see your project, your ideas, how you can bring more people inside, how you, you can motivate people to, to become the part of, of, the, of this vision for smart cities and smart society, how to motivate them actually. Yeah, so basically every single new things because we are now uh, making new things. So basically we are trying to innovate in this direction. So uh, we've seen that the only way or the only possible way from the commercial standpoint is that to incentivize people to do something, at least to taste for the first time. And then if they like, probably they will like and if they understand the value or the additional value as uh, creating the smart city concepts, which are helping the community, uh, basically will bring us more people on the outside, on our side. We as a market for business model currently are focusing on the left side. So basically we are engaged, are, are all things what we are doing, every single feature we are making is to make as much as possible to be seamless process and as in order to persons who will onboard on our platform to make as much as possible money with the less as possible effort so that's the idea so basically when you're making the commercial market for business model you have to choose either your supplier demand side uber in our side on the drivers we are in the side on the deliverers. so basically that's the idea uh, uh so at the end what we've seen here we are very pleased to say that in macedonia which is completely weird but uh, i think that telecom macedonia is very advanced because most of the new features of 5g's have been tested first in macedonia or, or these small countries so we are super advanced in that uh, term we don't have uh we don't have features or we don't have uh services which are using that 5g but i think that they have now implemented the first testing uh, after Zurich and, uh, and what I've seen Tokyo. So those are the first two and we are the third like third city which have implemented the 5Gs. And I think in, in the uh, broad range or in the US way, so I think the most advanced of what I really like the concept is the Helium Mo Mobile, I, I think that you have heard of. So basically Helium Mo Mobile is trying to engage normal people like us. So the crowdsource people to put that kind of routers in order to become the density what you need in order to reach that 5G uh, capacity for the future applications or services which will require, especially in the urban areas. And yeah, uh, we are engaging not only in software, we are now uh, doing in the other thing, which is called the hardware. So the software and the hardware are completely uh, built for servicing two main or, or to solving two main problems which are now happening. In the last mile logistics, we have two problems. The first problem and the capacity for problem means that there is not enough delivery people who can deliver that enormous growth of parcels. And the second thing is out of home mode. So people are not at home. So basically because the logistics thing are the oldest industry. So it, you know, previously the woman stays at home, the, the male works. So basically there is always someone who can receive parcels. Now and nowadays, there's no one at home. So basically we're building super smart uh the parcel lockers which will be placed around the city so we are now i have the three testing uh, places and we will expand that so uh and the next generation or the next way will be to have droids so basically the droids to come in your doorstep and deliver parcels so uh there are many things happening and i think that the the local government or governments here in southeast europe completely don't understand the novelty things so basically because we live in traditional place where uh, deploying of capital means immediate capital gains on the middle return of the return of investment which is possible especially if you're innovative uh, innovating so basically if you would like to, to try to do things which are, have never been done of course that will be a different type of risk takers or capital at risk it's called uh, we don't have access to that we are uh, working in the in the we are working with the other VCs, which are in Europe, and now we're focusing on US because our business model requires capital intensive uh, rounds, which will lead us to make a perfect product, not only for here, Southwest Europe. Southwest Europe, we are using as a testing environment because, as I said, it's not prepared for this kind of, of technology, but which requires you have, extensive you have capital. a clear business, business case actually behind because, as you said, that actually 
the, uh, there there is a chronic lack of delivery people and actually the problem with uh, nobody at home situations for delivery service. So it's pretty clear business business case if I can see for yeah, yeah. their application. Yeah, yeah, so for, of course. So basically you're incentivized people in order to, to do deliveries. So that's the only way. That's the only way at this moment. So yeah, those uh, green points or giving additional value to their deliveries, all these kind of features, which will keep them in the in the marketplace. It's it's not hard still here because we don't have big competition like huge players. Because you know, in the other cities, like if you're, for example, in Europe, there are several delivery prepared food delivery companies which are chasing for the same type of people. So those are the people who are willing to deliver parcels to the cities. Here in Macedonia, we don't have still a problem, but uh, we've seen that in other cities, yeah, of course, there's a huge problem because if there's a couple of competitors, then you're, you're fighting with them or you need to be the best in terms of incentivize them to, to be on your platform instead of to, to other platform, other uh, company in the platform economy. Perfect. Uh, actually, um, I'll try to, to, to go to closer to the end of our discussion because as I said, we have a shorter number of people and maybe maybe uh, it could be a great idea, but I also want to, to, to discuss with you, do you see opportunity how uh, your um, business case and your ideas can actually engage some advanced technologies which are coming actually, I will just tell you a few of them. Uh, of course, I discussed already about 5G because 5G is already in deployment phase, but also 6G is coming and the biggest uh, novelty in 6G will be uh, 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 distributed processing of data uh, already at the base stations closer to, to the sensors and application, not in the core of, of the network, but actually will decrease the latency and improve total performance of the network, what is critical for real-time application like self-driving cars or uh, remote surgeries and telemedicine and et cetera, et cetera. So also we can talk about uh, cloud and edge computing. We can talk about uh, uh, remote data centers, but in a little bit more advanced way that, than we have right now, because for now, for regular use and data centers, something what, what is related to Dropbox or, or Google Drive, but it's it's not real time actually processing what we need for some advanced applications. Uh, I would also uh, remind you of uh, other potential application in smart cities like uh, smart public transportation, a permanent counting of passengers, optimization of bus, tram, subways, routes. Because bus can change route if it's necessary. If something's changing in the city, like for example, if you have a big football match, like like for example, it's happening in Belgrade few times per year between Partizan and Zvezda, actually, you need to change actually the, the public transportation because huge amount of people going to the same point, actually. And, and, and there is no sense actually to keep the lines fixed because it's not the same that day and other days. This is just the basic example, just to, to, to be clear to everyone here. Uh, it's, it's typical graph theory problem and you can apply, of course, artificial intelligence to help you find solution. Uh, but it's not only about public transportation, as, as we discussed, the uh, smart waste management, uh, smart uh, infrastructure control, for example, for, for uh, water pipelines, you can identify uh, losses and you can uh, do dynamic uh, plan for maintaining uh, or for expanding your infrastructure in many ways. Uh, we can talk about roads or water pipeline or whatever. If you see that actually people are in need for something and you can detect that actually, you can prioritize some, some projects and optimize uh, budget and time and other resources engagement for, for, for this achievement. So do you see any potential application uh, uh, from your ideas actually for this kind of technologies or different kind of context except of delivery because your idea is great, your application is great. So I'm pretty sure that you see some potential to expand or also on something other than not only delivery. Yeah, so it's not only delivery. So basically multimodal transport is requires this kind of, of information. So basically the real data transfer is most important, as you said already in the latency needs to be low. And of course, that's the idea in order to make any kind of hardware products, which will directly communicate with the IOTs, which will give them a 
a perfect a real time uh, access to the data in order to make a, a right decisions because the right decision is most important these days. Uh, there are many many applicable uh, applications. We are just have started with logistics, but that can be extended in the e-commerce itself. That can extend with the mobility of the people. That can extend in different areas. And the idea is that we are already trying or making or preparing ourselves to use most of these technologies, especially AI is very important because for our matchmaking algorithm, it's extremely important to have uh, available data or relevant data in order to, to find the perfect driver or deliverer who can deliver items in a short period of time. Also, we are building our uh, hardware, as I already mentioned, and I think that that will help enormously in order to advancing the towards the uh, droids or drones which is uh, infrastructure, which is very different from, from this because it's requirement governmental. Uh, <laughs> so it needs to be regulated somehow because the drones is very um, unique way of delivering parcels in terms because they're a huge problem in if it's a huge volume or it's a problem if you're uh, trying to, to fly over the, the, the city, which is the one of the security reasons or insurance uh, reasons. So the problem why dr uh, drone uh, industries haven't achieved more in commercial way is because the insurance industry are not uh, still are not seeing a viable model of insuring the drones. Because if something happens, who is responsible? The operator or the drone? Someone who doesn't have a ID. So basically, it's impossible. Yeah. So uh, we will work in, in in many many different areas because we are now just opening like the the box of ideas and once we have enough data we have now enough data but once you have enormous amount of data you can find uh, correlations between them you can find a way how to optimize other industries which are directly correlated with the transportation or the mobility we are trying to solve uh, i think that southeast europe it take at least 10 years from now uh, to make additional advances because as i said the biggest problem is that uh, access to capital in the early stages where the people will try and error things uh, because that's the only way how you can innovate. That's my 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 point. Uh, thank you very much. And actually, uh, I suggest that we conclude uh, our discussion and at, at this uh, point. I think that we have a few important uh, takeaways from here. First thing, I think uh, that smart cities are a great opportunity for entrepreneurial action and you are amazing proof for that. And you have a very clear and great vision how to engage modern technologies to improve, deliver and total experience of urban living. Because I personally have a lot of issues with delivery because I'm never home. Some usually not in the country. <laughs> and that's that's the problem sometimes I, I, I lose my, my deliveries because of that and you know after five days uh post send it back to, to sender and etc etc but there is a there are a lot of opportunities for the end of story i would like just to remind all of us that uh, uh smart society is not only about smart cities i want to remind all of us that smart villages are also great opportunity because smart cities uh becomes the topic uh yeah fire fire topic because uh, accelerated urbanization because people don't want to stay in the rural areas but actually rural areas are something what we need because of agriculture and of course we always need food there is no way to product food in efficient way in urban areas and that's very clear especially in megapolis and very big cities multi-million cities uh, to keep people there in the rural areas we also need to think about how to bring urban services remotely to to, to villages like, for example, remote doctors, remote education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That means that we need to build the infrastructure to bring internet there. Universal access is also one of most important policies from the United Nations globally to, to enable actually internet everywhere. Even if we have just few users somewhere, we need to find a way to fund uh, uh, these projects to bring internet there. So smart society is not only about technology; it's about us to be ethical and you actually uh, underline that point that we need to, to, to be very careful about. There is always potential for misuse. And of course we need policies, regulation to, 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 to actually to, to educate people how to use uh, smart technologies to that we actually, all of us together can, can reach something what we name smart society in the 21st century. So David, thank you very much for this fruitful discussion. And I'm giving uh, 
the mic roll to, to, to Helena and Sandra for closing this, this amazing yeah. event. And I thank you very much once more. Thank you, dude. thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, everyone. So with Helena, we decided she opened the event and I'm uh, going to close it, and which makes it much easier for me because after hearing all of you and uh, your conclusion, Alexander, it's very much hard to add uh, uh, many things to it. Uh, just as a wrap up, uh, even though we started off a collaboration of the Academia Entrepreneurship with Innovators, and then we continued with Smart City, Smart Society, uh, this this is very much connected because, as, as you said, Alexandre, you know, a smart city is not only about smart technology, uh, and and also the the smart finance or let's say the lack of smart finance. Uh, it's it's about people. It's uh, creating uh, people who will do these uh, smart investments. So uh, we need to use these challenging times, as we know that every every challenging time creates new opportunities. Uh, uh, that we develop and innovate more. I've been to Israel last week and actually the challenges that they had made them being one of the Silicon Valleys, the first Silicon Valleys in the world. So let's use these challenges and create a, a smart society. So thank you everyone for joining today and wish you fruitful uh, other events of this investments week. Thank you everyone.